an unidentified flying object. Researcher on a mission with Dr. J. Andy Elias. Welcome back to another episode of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J. And as always, we have a fascinating show for you today. Today is one of my superstar heroes because he is so well-versed in all of ufology going back four decades, Mr. Peter Robbins. Peter, welcome to the show. Dr. J. Let's, let's, you wrote something about the ridicule factor and the origins about it. I figured that'd be a good place to start because every time we talk about this darn subject, mm. people just call us the kooks. And, and Travis Walton made a very good point the other day. He said, let's turn it around. <laughs> they're the kooks, not us. They're the kooks for calling mm. us, for ridiculing us because they're the ones that aren't opening up their eyes. <laughs> you know, what do you think of that? And then let's go back to the origins of this ridicule factor. Well, um, as you know, Dr. J, um, for many years I worked as the assistant to a uh, extraordinary man named, known to many of your listeners, Bud Hopkins, uh, truly the father of modern scientific research into the so-called UFO abduction phenomena. And occasionally, Bud, who had a wicked sense of humor and a brilliant intellect, used to reflect that the debunkers and the mean-spirited skeptics in fact, were the true believers because they knew that we were wrong. They knew that we're alone in the universe. They know that um, the mantra they live by is to the effect of uh, it can't be, therefore it isn't, therefore it's something else. And I think they see their position in the world as um, assisting us poor deluded people here who have these uh, wild ideas that perhaps there are other intelligences out there and that some of them may visit us fairly regularly, um, but that we're the ones doing our best to wrap our heads around this abiding series of mysteries. And Travis, um, who I'll be seeing this weekend, in fact, is absolutely right. And the writing that you refer to is something that I've worked on on and off for many years um, on what I would call the origins of of the so-called UFO ridicule factor. Um, it's as yet unpublished or undelivered at a conference, but sooner or later it will be. And like you, um, for me, the idea that a simple observation shared with a friend or a stranger or a business associate would be taken in such a out of proportion way and so different than any other topic in, in any kind of social discourse. And what I mean by that is this. Let's say that the UFO phenomena didn't exist, that it just simply had never happened. And I, we're old friends and we run into each other on the street and I say, hey, Dr. J, yesterday afternoon or last night I was out in my yard or out walking the dog and I looked up and I saw the damnedest thing. I saw this thing or things and their configuration, their behavior, their movements, uh, or its movement was unlike anything I've ever seen. It seemed to de defy all laws of flight. Uh, it was here one moment, it was gone the next, it was huge, it was small, it zigzagged, it changed color, whatever. And in a rational world, you might respond by saying something like, gee, that is interesting, I wonder what it was too cut to the real world since the summer of 1947 and the kenneth arnold incident in uh, the cascade mountain range of uh, beautiful state of washington and then only about a week and a half later the crash of some thing on the plains of saint augustine outside of the then modest town of roswell new mexico the question that i ask would be greeted and has been since that summer, with answers as varied as, what's wrong with Peter? Has he become uh, mentally ill or delusional? Has he become a mystic? Is he trying to hoax me? Does he want to be famous? Um, is he um, a liar? Is um, anything but 
facing the subject of an unknown object in the sky. How did that happen? It makes no sense. There's no logic to it. And yet the UFO ridicule factor permeates society to this day. Granted, we live in a time where more and more people are less and less willing to tolerate caring about what other people think about their having a view that there is something to this, that it's a serious subject, that it deserves examination and study. But still, overall, we represent a minority in any given society. How did that all commence? And after years of study, focusing in primarily on print journalism, because of course at the time in 1947, in that summer, television was still yet to be, radio was a powerful force, but there was a series of newspaper chains owned by a group of wealthy individuals and families around the United States, um, which drove newspaper sales and influenced smaller papers around the country and by extension in the Western world. I decided to zone in on what we can arguably call the flagship of American print journalism, the New York Times. And starting back in 1988, believe it or not, and taking long breaks and coming back in digital times and finishing the job then, I made it my business to spend many, many hours in the New York Times newspaper morgue, which at the time was housed in the main branch of the New York City Public Library one of my favorite buildings on the world and a true landmark on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street in Manhattan. And what I did originally working with huge, almost Dickensian ledgers, old pebble-covered ledgers with cross-referencing of every title imaginable, I started to search for every single article, editorial, letter to the editor, editor photo caption, headline, that had anything to do with flying saucers, flying disks, aerial phenomena, UFOs, unidentified flying objects, uh, extraterrestrials, etc. And when I would find them, I'd make a note, I'd get the microfilm, I'd find the article on the microfiche, I'd print it out, and I'd have a hard copy. And I did that for many months until I had put together as complete a collection as anyone could. I then took some years off, completed my work with Larry Warren on the book we were working on, Left at East Gate, about Great Britain's best known and best documented UFO event, and then went back to it once the, the files had been digitized years later and completed the job. And it was well over 200 individual items. Sometimes the times would go for months or a year or so without a UFO article. Other times, like during the great um, UFO overflights of 1952 over Washington, D.C., there could be up to four or five pieces in the newspaper in a single day. I put them all together, put them in um, chronological order, and started to read them and reread them and reread them. What I was looking for coming from a background in the arts, my training is as a painter and film historian originally, was a kind of moment of transcendence, a um, um, an epiphany where it would all come together for me and I'd see a pattern. And ultimately, and as usual, these things happen at two or three in the morning, there it was on whatever number reading of all of these pieces. And it was a pattern that was discernible in certainly 95% of the pieces, whether it was a huge front page piece or a paragraph, the initial report would be mentioned or introduced. Then we would um, be treated to the uh, New York Times rational pat on the head treatment of, um, you know, we live in times where there's a great deal of tension. It could be uh, a mass hallucination, it could be war jitters coming out of World War II, concerns about the Soviet Union, and then, of course, famous uh, rationales like swamp gas, weapons tests, you name it, reflections on the clouds, often 
so-called authorities are brought in in these coverage. And in the early days, it was almost always an astronomer or a psychologist, and very often completely anonymous. And the contempt and the condescension and the sarcasm that informed all of these pieces was so deliberate and 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 so heavy handed that um, I was really quite taken aback. Now, once that policy was in gear, and one has to assume at a certain point, given the inquiring open minded nature of most journalists, they are trained to be inquiring. They are trained to have open minds and look at a story or a report or an allegation from different angles. Every single reporter, every single editor and publisher seem to fall into lockstep about covering these pieces in this manner. Now, if you superimpose on these newspaper articles some of the many hundreds of pages of authentic, absolutely guilt-edged, declassified, confidential, secret, top secret documents, which are available to us, which are not being contested, which are fully authentic from the military, from the intelligence communities, and you superimpose them on this chronological timeline, you see something extremely schizophrenic. The documents overall, by and large and overwhelmingly, are taking this phenomena very seriously with great concern. And more often than many people who have not read through them might imagine, are saying flat out, maybe these are from other planets, other galaxies, other solar systems. They seem under intelligent control. They outclass us technologically in every possible respect. And after doing this research and putting together my findings, I began to reflect on what could have caused this. Well, there really weren't a lot of possibilities. And I'm fairly well known to build my cases, the um, papers I've done over the years, the talks I've given at conferences, the writing that I've published, it's very nuts and bolts. Um, I'm a very plotting, three-dimensional, real-world investigative writer. I don't have secret sources within the intelligence community. I don't get channeled messages from disembodied spirits or Martians. Um, I do the work. My mentors were three extraordinary men, Bud Hopkins being one of them, a man named Pete Mazzola, a tough, no-nonsense, Italian-American New York City police detective who was also a crack UFO investigator, and a man named Coleman von Kavetsky, who was a retired staff officer of the Hungarian army and in charge of all uh, photo analysis and photo reconnaissance during World War II for Hungary. They taught me to investigate the phenomena of UFOs the way overall um, law enforcement personnel might look for evidence to support a crime, not to draw the analogy that a crime has been committed, but to look for the kind of evidence one could present in court, uh, physical evidence, scientific evidence, photographic, witness testimony, historical evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And I was forced to make a series of deductions. When I was younger, I read almost everything that had been published by Harry Truman, his memoirs, his letters. Uh, he fascinates me as a figure in the 20th century. He was kind of an everyman who ended up president of the United States by a series of fate and circumstance and political deals. But, you know, he was an everyman. He was not somebody who President Roosevelt trusted. It was a political deal. He didn't even find out about the Manhattan Project till several hours after President Roosevelt had passed away. And his science advisor, Vannevar Bush, <laughs> had to lay out that project for him and the development of the, uh, the atomic bomb. And we do know, as well as we can know, that shortly after um, the events in Washington state in late June of 1947 and right around the time of Roswell, 
the president did call together a study group of men, um, certainly among the best in their field of military, technology, intelligence, psychology, to try to come up with some explanation for what had happened. Perhaps one of the greatest tragedies in history was that that secrecy keeping group enculturated itself and the secret was repressed rather than studied and then announced to the American people and by extension, the people of the world, something I feel that Truman would have wanted to do. But the concerns of the nation in the summer of 1947 were very specific. The Marshall Plan was going into play. We, we had saved the world from fascism to a great degree. America was a good and decent place in many respects, and we were trying to oversee the rebuilding of the world and watching fairly helplessly as a new foe grew on the horizon, Stalin's Soviet Union. And it's ironic to me, Dr. J, um, again, I'm obviously a student of American history as well as UFOs, that July 1947 is the month that many of the most distinguished American historians associate with the actual beginning of the Cold War. Why? Because that month, the very distinguished magazine still in print, Foreign Affairs, published an article that changed the history of the world. It was by a young guy who either was a graduate student or just out of school with a degree in um, political science named George Kennan. Now, Kennan died about 10 years ago or so at, I think, the age of 101, having served as an advisor to, I think, 10 American presidents from Truman, I think, to Clinton. And Kennan published a piece called On Containment, in which he described a method by which we could keep out of a shooting war with the Soviets and instead have a cold war and contain them within the borders that they had expanded into by the end of the Second World War, taking over a good part of Eastern Europe and so-called the Iron Curtain countries. Now, that same month, the entire UFO phenomena kicks in in earnest, and there was a need to be able to play those two forces in history against each other or use them in a way to mutually obscure certain aspects of the impending UFO threat or the impending UFO reality, whatever you want to call it, and the power of the Soviet Union and the potential, especially after 1948, when we found out that they had managed to get uh, through American spies, plans for a nuclear bomb, um, the world became a very different and a very dangerous place. I feel, I can't prove, but I feel very deeply that that summer and very early in that summer, no later than early July, <clears throat> emissaries went out from the White House, people extremely close to Truman, to meet with some of the most powerful people in American media, the people who owned and operated the most important newspapers. And something happened in those meetings. It could have been you know, this is all nonsense, but we were concerned that people will panic. Everybody remembered what happened after uh, the uh, the great um, War of the Mer Worlds, right? That's right. Mercury Theater, War of the Worlds, the brilliant adaption of H.G. Wells' play, a uh, novel into a radio play by the writer Howard Fass for Orson Welles' radio troupe. And that was broadcast the night before Halloween. 1938 and the panic that it caused around America is legend. And that was trotted out and is still trotted out occasionally as reasons for he can't tell the people. And I think one of two things happened. Either they met with these people and said the president would appreciate it if you would cover these matters in a fairly cavalier or flip way. The last thing we need is for think people to think that Martians are visiting us or that these same people um, 
Hearst and his syndicate, the Copley syndicate in Boston, the folks who owned and operated the New York Times, that the president feels that you need to know that this is real. It is happening. And the last thing we need is for the world to take that seriously. We're dealing with enough with the Soviets right now, post-war concerns, the rebuilding of Europe and Japan. Play along with us. One instruction to your editors, everybody will fall into line. And you know what, Dr. John? They did. They did. Ironically, when you study local newspaper coverage from around the country, you find that the great majority of local and town and village newspapers did take local reports seriously until the following week when letters would come to the editor. What are you doing taking this seriously? Don't you read the big papers? It's nonsense. That, in a nutshell, is a little about this unpublished work that I've done. But it's a good place for us to start tonight. Well, prior to 1947, as you said, that there was obviously something happened, and I, I totally wholeheartedly agree with you that Truman probably most likely sent people out there to quash this. But things that were reported going back to the uh, late 19th century, the airships. And oh, then, sure. Of course, the uh, the crash in Texas, uh, Aurora, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. The Battle of Los Angeles, the Foo Fighters, they were all seen in a, in a mysterious light, but they weren't ridiculed. So what? my question is about the presidents. Why do you think Roosevelt didn't necessarily address this topic the way Truman did? I think when you study um, the history of the 20th century and its impact on America, World War II especially, Roosevelt, who was a very competent leader in so many respects, was overwhelmed. I mean, let's face it, the um, Los Angeles incident occurred, I believe, 80 days after Pearl Harbor. Now, America was in a state of shock. Our The majority of our Pacific fleet had been vaporized in a few hours. The Japanese were running rampant all over the Pacific. It was a very dark time, something I think that those of us alive today unless we are serious students or professionals in American history, can't even wrap our heads around. But imagine if, you know, two months after Pearl Harbor, the president of the United States went on the radio and made an announcement to the effect of, ladies and gentlemen, um, a huge anomalous craft came in over Los Angeles yesterday. It's been established that it did not belong to us or the Japanese or any other government on Earth. We fired um, 1,430 rounds of artillery at it. None of them hit, and they were all aimed right at it. We don't know what else to make of it except to think that it was a machine from another planet. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, um, it couldn't have happened. It couldn't have happened. There was no way that, that a story like that could be allowed to go out. And to this day, it is still a mystery. Um, but we do know that there was something there, that it came in over L.A. And we also know from going over Japanese war records that they had nothing even remotely like that and certainly nothing over Los Angeles, you know, in that period of time. This was a huge thing. And again, it had 1,430 artillery rounds fired at it. I believe there were two deaths, one from a shell falling on a home, another uh, the result of a heart attack. It's amazing more people weren't killed directly under it. And then it moved away as though it had been, you know, impervious, that there was some kind of force field around it. Or This is all speculation, of course, but the event itself is not speculation. To try to label it as wartime jitters is ludicrous considering on the cover of L.A. Times, you clearly see something with spotlights on it. Yeah. I mean, that just blows my mind to say we're shooting at nothing. Well, there's something. It's right there. It's in a photograph. It's in a mainstream newspaper. I mean, what were they thinking? Do they honestly think people are that stupid? Well, I'm not sure if that particular incident was labeled in that manner. I think it was simply... And unknown. Um, the fear, of course, was that it was Japanese. We had just seen within everyone's memory two months before. And of course, there was a lot of footage that was being shown in movie theaters immediately after shot in Pearl Harbor. 
um, of the carnage, of the destruction that these little airplanes were creating on these huge battleships and other ships right there in the harbor. Um, Again, we're off on a tangent here, but there was so much to concern ourselves about as a nation. We had to find a way to um, create, turn over our entire industrial complex to manufacturing war machinery. Um, Now, of course, we wish we could turn it around. Um, But at the time, it was a noble, important, and patriotic effort that was quite extraordinary and how successful it really was. With regards to what we were talking about, uh, the ridicule factor, let's see, one of the comments here from Wise Frog is that humans are scared of change to let it be known that aliens are here. I would uh, somewhat agree with that. What do you think of that statement? Well, I, I think if you take all fear, all human fear down to its baseline, whatever it is, it's fear of the unknown. Am I going to lose my job? Is my wife going to leave me? Is my boyfriend going to flake out? Am I going to get cancer? Are my kids going to go on drugs? Will there be Social Security left by the time I retire? Is the world going to blow up? Is California going to run out of water? It's all fear of the unknown. And I think if there's a poster child for fear of the unknown, it's the idea for many decent people that, What if we're not alone? And what if this whole UFO thing is an indication or is part of the implication of beings from other places, other dimensions, other um, uh, universes, other solar systems uh, from the center of the earth, from the forest reaches of the galaxies, and they come and go with impunity? How's that going to affect my life and my family and my world? And if you are a person of faith. If you are a religious person who takes their religious texts and teachings seriously, then there's a whole nother level of challenges put upon your head. Um, Gee, if we're created in God's image, whose image are they created in? And how do they fit into what I was taught, you know, by my priest, Rabbi um, Mullah, Uh, you know, uh, minister or what have you. Um, If you're an agnostic, it's a whole nother series of problems. But again, uh, I think we're dealing here with the ultimate godfather of fear of the unknown come to roost. Now, I'm going to change direction and go to you uh, personally. 40 years ago, something happened that essentially kicked you off to, uh, to go down the path of studying this. <laughs> what, what exactly, I, we spoke about this off air, but I'm going to bring this to the public light. What exactly was it that you heard from someone close to you? Sure. Um, this is something that I've been public about for decades, um, but I'm glad to um, repeat it here. Mm. I had what I'd characterize as a very happy childhood. I was born in New York City, lived in New York City most of my life, still visit it very regularly. It is my home and always will be, even though I'm living uh, well out in rural New York State at this point in my life. And I came of age um, in a very picturesque little village about 30 miles east of Manhattan called Rockville Center in Nassau County for anybody familiar with the area. And it was a wonderful place to grow up. And something happened when I was 14 that was too difficult for me to fully take in. And I I guess it became the repressed memory of my childhood. Um, There's some irony in saying it this way, but if I have other repressed memories, I don't remember them. (laughs) That's right. Uh, In this case, though... um, my sister Helen and I, uh, who were quite close in age, were playing on the front lawn, and we observed five silvery white disc-shaped objects um, come in at a very high rate of speed and simply stop over the neighbor's house. They were um, in a very precise V-type formation, um, the way that you'd see, you know, uh, strategic craft flying. Um, And they were close enough that we could see that each one was like elliptical, like a dinner plate tipped, so it's an ellipse. 
that it wasn't shiny like uh, stainless steel, but more like um, subdued, like brushed aluminum. And we could observe they were close enough that we could see regular detailing around each edge that suggested nothing more than the way that windows would look on an airliner at a distance. And they hung there in the air for ever so long. And I looked at them and went through something that I've now come to call the checklist reaction. I've interviewed, I'm sure, 100, 200 more people over the years who have described an identical thing to me when they look up and they see something or things that can have a life-changing impact on you. And you simply start to go through your thoughts and go, this is not or these are not, you know, an airplane, helicopter, kite, blimp, balloon, uh, dirigible, strange shaped cloud reflection from the ground, birds, some floating bit of flotsam and jetsam. My God, what is that? And for me, as a 14 year old boy who never really was into flying saucers, I, it wasn't my thing. I, I drew and painted and cooked and collected bugs and comic books and stamps and coins and lived in my own happy little world. I read a lot. Um, I was a Boy Scout, um, real leave it to beaver type. And I, I saw, you know, movies on Saturday with my buddies, you know, the B movies that were coming out at that time that were, you know, funny and, um, you know, scary and a B movie kind of way about flying saucers invading the earth and the like. I guess for me, my intuition was I always understood that the adult world thought they were not real and I had no reason to question that, yet there they were. And I have to stress here again that there were no appendages. They were just discs and they hung there. And at a certain point, um, even though I'm looking at what is arguably the most amazing thing I've ever seen, I had had it. My anxiety was that peaked. Um, it just challenged too much for me. And I went to run into the house to tell our mother. And I'm going to shorten the story a bit and say that later that afternoon, um, my sister asked me if I wanted to talk about this. And I said, no. I got out two books from the Rockville Center Public Library that day that I hope would explain it away for me. Give me some kind of grown up explanation that what I had seen was some natural phenomena or whatever. Um, my last thought in looking at them desperately was, and it's a 14 year old thinking this, that they were some kind of, my words, secret government test plane. They had to be some kind of secret government test plane. But, you know, planes have wings and tails and that kind of stuff or propellers or jet engines, what have you. And late that afternoon, my sister asked me if I wanted to talk about it. And I said, no. And within a matter of a week, two weeks, I don't know how long, I had done the impossible. I had convinced myself that whatever it was, was something explainable and I did not have time or the inclination to give it any more strategic thought and life went on. And um, I nursed along my natural talent as an artist, um, sang, was president of our school choir, um, went on to university and then to art school. And by my late 20s, I was living my dream. I was a young painter in lower Manhattan teaching at my alma mater, um, working construction jobs during the Soho building boom, helping to renovate one of the old factory buildings after another into galleries and shops and great extraordinary apartments. I, I worked as an, the apprentice assistant to a number of artists, some of them very well known. Um, for a year, I was studio assistant to Adolf Gottlieb, um, a good friend of Jackson Pollock and Franz Klein and one of the uh, most respected abstract expressionists. And um, one afternoon in 1975, 
um, the memory returned to me with a vengeance and I was overcome. Um, I think there were several reasons that I understand why it came back then, but probably the most important one was that I was simply ready to deal with it. And I, I really had, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. How can you forget something like that? And when I finally calmed down, I collected my thoughts and I thought, what am I going to do? I, you know, half thought I was going crazy, but I knew that I could speak to somebody who would either confirm it or not. And that was my sister. At the time, this was about a year before my sister's career as a singer songwriter exploded. Um, and at the time she was kind of a poor, as a church mouse artist herself, poet making her living, um, designing and executing uh, into reality um, one-of-a-kind leather clothing for rock and rollers, including her boyfriend's group, which went on to become the Blue Oyster Cult, one of the great heavy metal groups of all time, still dear friends of mine. And I realized that if I just called her and blurted out my memory, she'd say yes or no. And I'd never really know for sure if she remembered what I remembered. So I composed myself and I called her and I asked her if this was a good time to talk. It was. Told her that I had remembered something that from childhood that I felt that we had shared, but I needed to know what she remembered about it and that I didn't want to just, I explained the situation. And she said, how do you want to handle it? And I told her I was going to set the scene. And I started to talk about the time of year, how old we were, where we were standing in the front yard, about how far away. And she stopped me mid-sentence and simply said, stop, I know what you're talking about. And told me what I just told you and then more, which will hold for another time. And then she said, but there's more and you're not going to like it. And I said, what? And she said, well, um, I remember that moment when you started to peel off to the right and disappear from my peripheral vision. And I knew you were running into the house to tell mom, but the strangest thing happened, which was about two seconds later, I saw a blue light, a blue beam of light shoot out of one of these things. And even though I was 12 years old, I knew I couldn't be seeing what I was seeing, but what I was seeing was the beam of light in clear daylight like a flashlight beam at night in the fog, like a long line of light going right down to the ground. And I turned around and I saw you in the light and the light went out, you fell down. And then I just lifted off the ground and my hair was blowing and the bottoms of these things was getting bigger. And then she described a series of memories of being inside one of these things with two types of beings, uh, small archetypical gray type beings and one larger one, and them talking in her head without saying anything, and then being on a table and being examined. And in that moment, series of moments, I guess very briefly, I preferred to think that my sister had simply just gone insane on the phone and then had to catch myself and admit that moments earlier, we were talking about something that I had brought up as a reality, which was uh, five flying saucers over the neighbor's house with windows on them. And I, my sister and I were particularly close. I lost her in 2000, but we were very close brothers and sisters, adored each other, uh, were um, fellow artists, you know, um, good friends. And she wasn't a liar um, any more than I was. And she had no reason to manufacture this story. I also have to stress here in 1975, I had never heard anything like this in my life. Now, even if you could care less about UFOs, you've heard variations on this in films, in pop culture. Um, you know, it's a subject of advertisements and cartoons and breakfast cereals and, you know, it permeates our culture, the idea of abjection in that sense, even if you don't accept it. And so people talk about, oh, my life changed overnight. Well, my life changed in 60 seconds. 
And I'll tell you what, Dr. J, I resented the hell out of it. All I had ever wanted to be more than anything from the time I was five or six, and I was a very gifted young artist. I had special um, oil painting lessons when I was eight years old. I had no idea how my parents sacrificed to give those to me. I was, you know, certainly one of the best artists in my high school, university, and then started to study at what I think is still the best art school in America, the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, where I'm proud to say I was a faculty member for 14 years or so, taught painting in their School of Continuing Education and in other places. And that's what I wanted to do, that and be a photographer. Um, ended up with a, a degree uh, with a minor in film history, which is a passion of mine as well. And all of a sudden, something more important that obsessed me more had smack dab landed in the middle of my life, and I hated it. Um, I still painted and drew for many years to come, but the heart was gone out of it. I played at it, and <laughs> the subject matter of my work did change overnight uh, very dramatically. And that, in a nutshell, is, to put it mildly, how I became involved in the field of UFO studies. Because you worked so so long with Bud Hopkins, I'm sure you've, I know you know this, that extraterrestrials, when they're dealing with, when we're talking about alien abduction, they seem to go down family lines. So if you've been taken, more than likely your children will be taken and so were your parents. Do you have any memories of you being taken or do you know of your parents being taken or possibly your sister's children being taken? Uh, number one, Helen had no kids. Um, my other sister, definitely not. Same with her kids. We've explored it over the years. Um, there is a phenomena, and it's as historic as the study of abductions itself, where all siblings are not necessarily involved. Um, spouses, friends, the brother or the sister are shut off when the other one is taken. And once... I began to learn about this, which was certainly not immediately. This happened in 1975. Bud Hopkins and I met and became friends the very next year in 1976 as painters with an interest in this subject. Remember, this was already five years before he had even published his first book. But he was very interested in the phenomena as well. And we built our friendship on our love of painting history, literature, our love of living in New York at such an exciting time, and the damned UFO phenomenon. And Helen and Bud developed a wonderful friendship of their own. Some few years before my mother passed away in 1998, she mentioned something that was quite shattering to me as well, which was that she felt it might have happened to her as a young woman. And I, I was... I mean, nothing should have seemed more logical to me. I had spent years, years immersed in this study in the privileged position of being Bud's assistant and privy to a tremendous amount of confidential information that I did never and will never share about hundreds of individuals, many of whom I met and spent time with, as well as members of their family. And in some cases, physicians, psychologists, other medical or mental health professionals who had worked with them and took them very seriously. And how could I have not given that much thought to how this fit into my family group? Um, my father had, and still does, a great intellectual interest in the subject, uh, is quite well read in it, watches the documentaries, spent time with Bud uh, in his studio, took it all very seriously. My mom was not as comfortable with the subject, which is something that is an indicator. Uh, like many people that have this happen, many of them don't read books on abduction. It's the last book they want to read. Um, they're living it. Other ones do. You know, their intellectual curiosity is fueled by things that have happened to them. There's no hard, fast rule. But yes, I, I do feel that um, it happened very likely to my mother. And after a few years of working with Bud, um, I did look into this. 
and multiple times because I know that memories can be screwed around with. And they, for lack of a more descriptive term, and I'm not comfortable with aliens and I don't know they're extraterrestrials, I blanketly call them other intelligences wherever they come from and why ever they're here. But I had a friend who had taken, who had qualified, studied hypnotherapy and qualified, and he was the first person to hypnotize me. And I instructed him to do what he could to get at any memories that might be related to this, and there were none that came up. And then Detective Sergeant Mazzola uh, hypnotically regressed my sister and I in the same spirit. Helen was filled with memories. She did two sessions with him. Um, for me, again, you know, an empty bucket as far as that went. And then finally, Bud Hopkins did regressive hypnosis with me on this. And I have to think, for the 15, 20 years on and off that I worked at Bud's side and witnessed many hypnotic re um, um, regressions at the request of the individual or Bud or both, always with the permission of the individual, attended more support group meetings as, you know, Bud's assistant than I can even remember, spent time with hundreds of abductees, knew all of the presenting signs, the ones that are well known, the ones that are not so well. I think something should have rattled it loose, you know, sometime in the last 40 years. So I'm as convinced as I can be that I have not had that experience. And you know what? I think if I did, I might well walk away from this for good. <laughs> Other people would say, oh, no, you'd be used to it. And I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, it's one thing to study anything. It's another thing to have it happen to you. I agree. As much as I would like to, to see them, uh, just like you, I don't know where they come from or what, what they're doing, but I, it scares the crap out of me to, to, the, you know, to know if they landed and, and I was on board. Uh, big thing with Bud, we got a little under eight minutes before break, so I don't know if this mm. might carry it over, but big thing with Bud Hopkins, uh, you share a lot in common with him, obviously, uh, both in, in Manhattan. You studied in Manhattan, him living mm. in Manhattan, both of you having a big interest in ufology specific. Uh, alien abduction and mm. both of you being artists yes did any of the fact of your of the studying ufology the interest you've had in it the the sighting that you had as a young as a youngster with your sister did any of that reflect in your paintings after that oh good god immediately it was a joke almost um if i showed you my work that i was doing say for the year leading up to that it was quite esoteric and I, I think in, in a very interesting way, oh, you know, affected intellectual. Um, I was interested in ancient mysteries. Um, I was doing lithographs of the pyramids, um, uh, watercolors of fragments of Mayan pottery, um, different schools of, of visual arts, but dealing with ancient mysteries as themes, but UFOs never, you know, you could say, well, how could that not? Well, it didn't. It just didn't interest me. Um, almost immediately after, I became like Richard Dreyfus in Close Encounters, you know, building the Devil's Tower out of mashed potatoes. I was obsessed. I just kept doing ellipses and discs and um, flying saucers and UFOs superimposed on crucifixes and uh, skies filled with different phenomena, and um, it proved to be very embarrassing some months later in that um, a young woman who was developing a stable of ar artists who went on to become, huh, ironically, one of the most successful, successful art dealers of the 20th century, um, had liked my work and had seen it some months before and came for a follow-up um, studio visit to my studio in Chinatown to see what I had done in the intervening time. And I, I think she was shocked. She was incredibly uncomfortable. I, I, I was mortified. I mean, I literally hadn't thought about it till that day, how she might react. I was just, you know, doing my UFOs for the day. And as she looked at the drawings and went through my portfolios and was looking at my new paintings, 
I I could see she was more and more, you know, her body language was stiff. She wasn't speaking much. I had an impulse to try to tell her what had happened. And I thought, well, that'll send out her out of here screaming. Mm -hmm. And so it it was a terribly awkward afternoon. Um, she told me um, she felt uncomfortable around this work. Something obviously had happened since she had seen me last that affected my work. It was not as interesting to her commercially or artistically more. It disturbed her. She wished me well with whatever I was struggling with or thinking about and left. And let me add more for the percentage of people in your audience that are somewhat knowledgeable in the art world. That young woman was named Mary Boone. Mary at the time was an accountant who specialized in doing taxes for artists in New York. And Mary went on to become one of the most successful and powerful art dealers in America and is still in the work. And um, I guess if I run into her at some point in the future, I have a little story to break the ice or send her out of the room. Um, she was a very nice woman and I only wish in many respects that I had been looking the other way <laughs> and that I had a career as a painter. Um, not that I'm complaining. I, I think the work I do is important. I think it's valuable. It's given me a life that is very interesting, that's taken me all over the world and introduced me to people I would have never met otherwise, some of the dearest people I could ever know, uh, given me travel opportunities I could not have imagined when I was younger, and like that. You know, now this it definitely will probably carry us into break. Being on the same topic of, of abduction still, a name that we brought up early on in the show, someone that you are going to see this weekend and you are having a collaboration with, mm. Travis Walton. Mm -hmm. His case is very different in that his family wasn't taken, his children Correct. weren't taken. He only had one case and of course he's starting to believe that he wasn't taken because they wanted to do experiments on him but possibly that they may have killed him and instead of leaving him dead may wanted to have uh, made sort of an ambulance call what mm -hmm. what do you think about that i mean again this only gives us a couple minutes before we go to break and it'll carry over until after yeah i want to wherever talk we leave off we'll pick up um I was introduced to Travis, like many people, years before I met him, um, or, well, many people have never met him, of course, and that was in 1979 when his book, Fire in the Sky, was published. Uh, I was building my still-fledgling UFO library at the time, which is quite large now, and I bought that book, and I read it, and I was quite knocked out by it. He was obviously not a professional writer. But he made up for it with heart and with courage and um, integrity. And I took it in. It was an epiphany to me in that this was the only other person that I had ever come upon in my studies who had also been hit by a blue beam of light, which I did recover very clear memories of that in two out of three of my hypnotic regressions. Boy, oh boy, did I. But the way I joked with myself at the time was that the dial must have been turned way the hell up with him. And for those people in your audience that are not familiar with this story, which was the subject of a major motion picture when almost 20 years ago now, I guess, uh, with the late, great James Garner, um, Robert Patrick, best known um, shortly thereafter as an international film star as the liquid metal man in the original Terminator movie, uh, but who played Mike Rogers, Travis's best friend and another member of the logging crew. Travis Walton was um, a young man who was a professional logger, and he grew up in the town of Snowflake, Arizona, population 5,000. And on that particular day, November 5th, 1975, he and his crew were finishing up a logging assignment. And, uh, you know, the sun was going down. It was November. And they observed a glow on the horizon, being country guys, spending their professional lives in the woods. Their first impulse 
was that maybe this was the beginning of a forest fire and they raced to the location and there was no fire. There was, however, a good size, fully articulated disc shaped object hovering over a clearing. I don't know, 30, 40 feet up, whatever. And all the other guys were righteously anxious about it. Travis, <coughs> at his own admission, something of a risk taker, certainly when he was younger, jumped out of the cab and impulsively ran out under it. And after a macho moment, realized maybe this had not been the smartest decision of the day and made a move to return to the truck. And here things get very theoretical, Dr. J. Um, was there an intelligent being looking on his scope or out the window who decided to push a button and a, a blue beam of light shot out and hit Travis? Was the craft itself somehow so advanced that it was partly mechanistic and partly biological and it reacted? However, it happened. When that bolt of light hit that young man, it threw him through the air at least, well, between 12 and 15 feet is the best estimate I put together from Travis and the guys that were with him. And when he landed, there was no movement and steam was coming off him. And Mike, who I believe was behind the wheel, gunned the engine and they took off. It thought he was dead. Exactly. We'll pick up that point when we return. Everybody stay tuned so much more with Peter Robbins right when we come back. Uh, Mr. Robbins, where can everyone find you and what's in the works for you? Um, well, with Travis Walton to premiere um, the feature length documentary, Travis, which I was an associate producer on. We'll also be doing that same thing um, later this year in Memphis, in Roswell, in Minnesota, and a number of other locations. Um, my next speaking date, besides this weekend, will be next month, I believe, if it's Saturday the 16th for Pennsylvania MUFON. And uh, no, I take that back. Next speaking date is April 23rd in Rochester, New York also uh, in tandem with screening the documentary. Um, so that's some of the stuff that's cooking right now. And right when we come back, uh, after we announce this winner, we're going to talk, pick up where we left off, because that's also one of the things you're working on. In case anybody else out there, 818-923-1713. Again, 818-923-1713. If you want to have any questions for Mr. Robbins or myself throughout this hour. And of course, you can also send out, uh, you know, more. You could send out tweets and everything else with regards to um, text, to messages. I do have a question that I can read out later. But Danny, do you have a question for Peter? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, first of all, um, Peter, um, I'm really enjoying uh, listening to you. Um, what a tremendous loss with uh, Bud Hopkins. Yes, uh, yes. Just tremendous. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to ask you, um, could you describe what it's like in sitting in so many sessions and uh, with, with Bud and, and, and seeing uh, the hypnotic regression go down, um, the sessions ha actually happening? Could you describe um, a, a session? Do they get intense? Uh, do, how... how, how is it different for everybody? How do people behave generally? It's a wonderful question, and it varies. Uh, I think in any hypnotic regression, because it's, uh, it's still considered a highly controversial manner of retrieving information. Uh, some people discount it completely. Others um, seem uh, focused on the possibility or potential of an unscrupulous or an agenda-driven individual putting things into someone's mind rather than helping them retrieve things from one's subconscious or um, consciousness. For starters, the character of the individual doing the work is Tatamont. Um, Bud... Detective Sergeant Mazzola, who I also work with, 
uh, people that I know in the field, including um, e Yvonne Smith, who is lives fairly close to you guys. Um, these are extraordinarily decent people dedicated to assisting others in learning more about events that have happened to them. Uh, for some people, the event is filled with wonder. For others, it's terrifying. And there are no rules. Um, I saw Bud at times spend up to half an hour putting somebody in the deepest state of calmness possible um, in order to have them as fully relaxed as they could be. Also, be aware that no one that I ever observed was doing this because they were being compelled to by somebody else. This is a very personal decision. And um, I reflected on it several years, in fact, before I did any of my own sessions. Um, I can tell you to digress for a moment that by the time I was ready to do it, I was curious. Um, whatever anxiety I had about what might come up that did not come up, um, I had made my peace with. Uh, all three of the people that I work with told me I was a good subject in that I went into alpha state very deeply. Some people will observe themselves at an earlier time with the aid of a, um, uh, a very helpful suggestion from uh, the hypnotherapist or the individual doing the work that they can observe themselves outside of their body from a location where they feel safe. Um, I simply was 14 years old again. And there was something about, something that, about that that was almost joyous to me. Um, I was 14 again and not in my 30s or 40s or what have you. I smelled the grass. I, in listening back to the audio cassettes and, and responsible practitioners literally always record the individuals they work with for several reasons. The individual has a record they have a record if the individual wants them to have it for further research and to cover themselves in case somebody should ever make a claim that they acted in some unethical manner. There is a record of it that can resolve it. Um, but I was using words and terms that I had forgotten existed. They were, you know, words I put together as an adolescent, not ones I did as an adult. Um, it was very moving to me as well. Um, but it's very poignant. Bud was nothing if not a humanist. He cared about people tremendously and he never asked for a penny. And I can tell you because this is the old pre-digital days, I logged in almost all of those tapes over the years and there were more than a thousand of them by the time that he died. Um, some people did one session, others did many sessions. Uh, he also did preliminary interviews that were also audio recorded. Every once in a while, somebody would go through absolute hell and he would be there in every way that he could either to take them out of it, if that's what they wanted, or to assist them in moving on and reassuring them that it was not happening now, that it was something that had happened to them in the past. Also, to dispel another myth, there's this idea that people would have walked into Bud's or Dr. Max or Dr. Jacobs or Yvonne's or whomever is doing the work and say, yeah, I have this free floating anxiety. And, you know, somebody suggested I go see you. And as soon as you're under, they're saying you were abducted by aliens. Woo. Um, in fact, almost all of the people that Bud worked with had very clear partial memories of what had happened to them on the occasions that it had happened. They were not coming in blind to the possibility. In fact, it was curiosity more than anxiety that ultimately made them feel that this was something they needed to know about or wanted to know about so much, but also it always discouraged them at first. Are you sure this is something you want to do? Have you discussed this with the people closest to you? Have you really reflected on it? Are you aware that if we do this, you may find yourself anxious or frightened because you'll be reliving things that were frightening to you and so on? Um, 
it was never anything less than fascinating and sometimes incredibly emotional for me as well. And I might be no further away than four or five feet from Bud and the individual kind of triangulated together, them on the couch, Bud in his chair and me in mine. So in a nutshell, I hope that gives you an idea uh, of some of what it was like to actually um, be in that privileged position with him. Danny. It absolutely does. And um, another huge boss, uh, Dr. John Max. But um, uh, yes. just going back to what you were saying, uh, you know, I've heard people take shots at Travis Walton, but Travis Walton probably, uh, in my opinion, hit. Uh, even without the regression, mm-hmm. um, his case is the, you know, it, it does, uh, it, it, it has, the, it holds the most, has the most evidence. It, it's the, uh, the, the case that got me interested in all of this. And um, I think Travis says, um, you know, he's really learned a lot mm-hmm. um, over his lifetime and, um, and he's grown as a person. Um, yes. You know, he's had a lot of time to put this all into perspective. And like Dr. John was saying, Dr. Jay was saying a little while ago um, about how um, Travis has changed his opinion on feeling like maybe he got too close and he was actually rescued as opposed to abducted. Yes, you, you bring up several important points. I agree with you that... To be dispassionate and as professional as I can, because this is a friend of mine, the Travis Walton case is in kind of a place by itself. Um, And it's it's as highly credible a case as we have to present, so to say, to the outside world. However, I'd rank at least two cases of real people who I know and adore as highly. One is a woman who lives in Indiana, named Debbie Jordan Cabell, who was the subject of uh, Bud's extraordinary investigation that was ultimately published under the the title of Intruders, The Incredible Visitations in Copley Woods. Uh, And the evidence to back up Deb's experience is, is every bit as powerful as Travis's. And the other person is another remarkable woman who I have undying admiration and affection for and tremendous respect for, and that is Linda Cortile, a woman who lives in lower Manhattan in a neighborhood she's lived in really all her life, whose story was told in um, the most remarkable investigation I ever worked on in abduction studies. It was something that I worked on almost weekly with Bud for six years, and it was published in 1966 under the title of the Brooklyn Bridge UFO abductions, uh, witnessed the story of the Brooklyn Bridge UFO abductions. But these um, are all extraordinary cases. And you are right. Travis, who started his life as a young man in a very small town in America, working with his hands, you know, not some college. I don't know whether he went to college, frankly, um, but he was blue collar and he was not and classic abductee, as we've noted earlier, he was in the wrong place at the right time or the right place at the wrong time. And he got hit. Um, Again, we're dealing with theoretics here and it's anybody's guess what really happened. But there is compelling evidence to suggest that when that light shot out, it stopped his heart, you know, to be blunt. And that they took him aboard to restore his functioning and held on to him for several days beyond that to make sure he was okay and then let him go on the outskirts of town. Now, this is one of a number of possibilities. Um, Travis takes it seriously now, um, as do a number of my colleagues. I'm certainly open to it, but I'd be um, absolutely wrong and irresponsible and arrogant as hell to say that's what happened. Um, I think it's one of the problems in this work that I have colleagues who are well-meaning, 
um, and who sometimes, you know, were not governed by an AMA or American Psychiatric Association. You want to be a ufologist? This is how you qualify. You touch your finger to your nose and you turn around three times and you say, I'm a ufologist. And guess what? You are. You immediately get your degree. You hang out your shingle and you do work. And if you want to say to people, there are 58 alien races visiting this world, which I find statements like that outrageous. Nobody can know something like that or that all aliens are good. I mean, this is the height of irresponsibility to me. Um, or that you you were abducted because you asked to be abducted in a previous life and you don't remember it. This is insulting beyond belief. But there are people that take their theories, their agendas, their longings, their fears, and they simply superimpose them on data and say, well, that's the way it is. And let me tell you about the Pleiadians and um, the Nordics and, you know, the, the dog star people. And these ones are coming here for this reason and for this many years. And this is what they have for breakfast. And I'm only half joking. Um, again, how do I, um, I'm irresponsible to say, I know that's not true because how could I possibly know? However, I think that one has to be very careful and exercise as much discipline and respect for the unknown as one can. There's a wonderful definition of a Zen beginner. It's knowing that you know nothing and having it be okay. I've walked all over India when I was younger. I've climbed in the Himalayas. I've had my adventures. Um, I've taken lots of psychedelics back in the day, but I don't know what the hell's going on. I have a better idea than most people. I know we're not alone. That much I do know. Um, I have my theories about where they come from, how many days there might be, why they're here, but they're just my theories. Some of them I can give some support to. As I said at the beginning of the show, I do my best to put evidence together in a meaningful real world way and ground my presentations often in post-war history to try to get people through that first door. I'm not, you know, I'm not vibrating at a very high frequency, according to some. And, you know, I do the best that I can as an educator in this field and am very clear to separate what I know from what I can prove from what I believe or think from what I'm concerned might be, from what I fear, from blah, 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 where other people will just kind of put it all together and there's nobody there to stop them. You know, it's it's one of those areas of study where it's sort of like the Wild West. Peter, I'm so glad you brought up the irresponsibility factor because for anybody out there to claim they have all the answers, it's just ludicrous. Uh, Danny, thank you for your questions. If you have yes, any Yes, thank you so much, Danny. Great question. I- Thank you. you uh, I, my respect level for you, just in the in the last two questions, it, it, it just beyond belief. Hey, listen, um, my friend. Got, thank you. Sure. But let me explain, just say one thing here, and to anybody that's listening, whether or not you're well-known or a published author, or you're looking into this on your own, whether you're a serious student, you know, paying your bills and supporting your family, or you're in a, a somewhat privileged, if irresponsible, impractical position like I am. This is a terrible way to earn a living. Um, we are all in this together, from the best known to the least known. We're brothers and sisters in it. And I, I salute you for your wonderful question and your kind remarks. But please don't think of me in some elevated way. I'm just doing my best on a daily basis to get word out to study, to put things together, to present things. Um, but I'm in the trenches with the rest of you guys. But you're doing a damn yeah. fine job. Danny, if you want to stand by for more questions, we do have one more uh, caller real quick. You're more than welcome to wait till after the other caller. Uh, area code 717, uh, welcome to the show. What's your name? My name is Lou Sheehan in Rancho Cucamonga. Ah, and Lou. Mr. Robbins, I have, yeah, hello. Hi, Lou. I have two kind of themes. Hello. Mr. Robin, or Peter, if I may. Yeah, please call uh, me two Peter. Two of questions. Um, did, 
the first one is serious. The second one I'm going to tease. I'll give you the heads up already. Um, your sister, apparently she was abducted. I, I arrived home late, unfortunately, so I may have missed some of your explanation. But your yes. sister uh, was abducted, as I understand it. Did yes. she tell you anything about the nature of the aliens? That is, what they look like, you know, oh, their sure. thought processes, how they behave. Well, and let me get my second question in, and then sure. I'll let you. Um, I want you to tell me about the Dog Star people, race number 59. Oh. Why don't you tell me everything you know <laughs> I, about I grabbed that. that out of the air. Um, <laughs> I couldn't yeah, tell you a damn thing I'm about the Dog Star people because I don't even know if there are people there. <laughs> or whether they're All right, dogs. yeah, let's get back to your sister. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Sorry. <laughs> Well, this is good. Go we ahead, have to yeah, add some was, of this humor. Go, go yeah. ahead, guys. Um, yeah, sorry. But that, back to your sister, if you will. Yes. Um, that first day when Helen and I discussed her memories, when she told them to me, and I, I just listened in shock. But then when she began to work with Bud Hopkins and Detective Sergeant Mazzola, um, more detail. She went into more detail. Um, she did drawings. Um, now I look at them and they're beyond archetypical, although back then they were anything, but, um, Helen remembered, you know, fragmented memories, primarily, um, being walked through a metal hallway by a number of beings that when she first described them to me, the word gray didn't exist. It's 1975. Um, she described them in her hypnotic memory and her girl's memory when she said, you know, back when I was 12 years old, I, I described them to myself as little doctors with big heads and big black eyes who talked to me inside of my head. And there was one that looked like them, but it was much taller and seemed to be in charge. Hmm. And then I'm on a table and they're all grouped around me and I'm hearing things inside my head that they're telling me, which included what I would call stock phrases. I've heard them more times than you'd believe from people here and abroad who I'm convinced have been through similar experiences of we've seen you before. We'll see you again. You're special. We love you. We won't hurt you. However, there did come a time in, in that particular series of memories when they had her on the table and the voice in her head said, you know, we love you. We won't hurt you at a time that they were hurting her. Mm -hmm. Helen also told me that, and this is very important, um, over the years that we didn't talk about this, that had, it was not even a memory of a memory for me. I was that successful with repressing it until it came flooding back um, 40 years ago. Helen never forgot it, never forgot it. It would be something she'd regularly reflect on, not with fear, not with happiness, but she said it was something that she would think of and it would remind her that she did feel special. And my sister was special. Uh, no question about that. And when I finally said to her, Lou, why didn't we ever talk about this? She said, that afternoon, I came up to you and I said, do you want to talk about this? And you looked at me and you said no. And I knew you were upset about it. Um, you're my brother. I love you. I respect you. And so we didn't talk about it that week or the next month or the next year but that, that's or the common, year though, after. Isn't it? That, that's so common. Like the Allagash yes. guys, at the moment they yes. came back to their campfire, they just yes. went to sleep. A perfect example. And that's another one of the most important and well-documented incidents we have to work with. And my God, uh, um, Charlie and Jack are two of my favorite people in the world. Forget about the work. Um, talk about courage. Um, they're just remarkable. They're, they're just remarkable. Um, but, I mean, it was that simple. Sometimes life is that simple. Um, once we did start to discuss it, it was something that Helen, who was not concerned about 
social graces. Um, she was one of the original punks. She was a tough chick. She also was very brilliant. She had a degree in English literature. She was a graduate of the French Fashion Institute. Her costumes by themselves were absolutely uh, way ahead of their time as a performer. Um, she was without peer and through her, I mean, uh, you know, you think about the way your life dovetails sometimes into other people's lives and the moments in history it brings you into. The first time she dragged me, literally kicking and screaming to CBGB's to see her friends, the Ramones, play, I thought, what the hell? Um, but I got it. I mean, there was a brilliance and a very, uh, always a great underpinning of, of tongue-in-cheek humor uh, with all the angst. And through Helen, I met gosh, Patty Smith and Debbie Harry and the Talking Heads and um, yeah. Richard Hell and the Voidoids and, you know, all of the great performers of that time in that tiny little club, they were all friends. Um, and she was outspoken as hell about her experiences. She used it as a subject for lyrics. Um, uh, images appeared on some of her uh, early records. And in fact, she did something really radical in an EP, an extended play um, record that she put out uh, in the early 80s. I think it probably is historic in terms of the record industry. Two of the inserts were Xeroxes of declassified UFO government documents with an admonition to people to educate themselves. You know, the government is covering this stuff up. And that was in the early 80s. I mean, this That's woman was amazing. way ahead of her time and had guts to spare. Uh, Lou, yeah. any, any more questions? Uh, or Danny, both uh, of you Only guys? if I can, only a little bit of elaboration. I thought uh, Peter said that, well, was she abducted again? Because the alien said to her in her mind that we will see you again. And then I'll let Dr. J do his question. Oh, yes. She had several experiences and she uh, explored at least two of them in depth over the years with Bud. Um, I have the audio cassettes of the sessions that she did, but for a number of wow. reasons, it's very poignant, kind of too poignant to me to listen to them now. It took me a number of years to start to listen to her music again after she died, but uh -huh. it's still kick ass. It's wonderful music. And um, well, well, the tapes, leave them to me in your will. Right. I'd like to hear them. I'll talk to my my relatives about that. Uh, <laughs> I would uh, yeah. like to hear them, or they'd be interesting. If you, yeah. whenever well, you feel comfortable playing them again, public, um, that would be interesting. If you were to talk to um, other individuals who have had these experiences, who have decided to undergo hypnotic regression. Um, you would probably find out that the huge majority of them, certainly the majority, certainly the ones working with really responsible hypnotherapists or individuals doing the work, do are always given copies. Now, probably it's much more common, well, I'm sure overwhelmingly to be given a DVD copy and earlier on and, you know, a VHS copy, but back in the day, um, and I, I still... Well, your um, sister in particular would be credible just because she has a, another witness. Um, that's what I'm not saying. Well, exactly. You're saying find yes, someone. You're right. I, mean, I and specifically was interested in your sisters. Yes, you're absolutely personal, right. And but. you bring up another very important point there, which is I've interviewed ever so many people who have had shattering sightings on their own. And there is kind of a cosmic loneliness to it for some of them that it was unshared, it was overwhelming. Um, and we have those moments in life in non-paranormal ways. I remember horseback riding in the Himalayas and the sky cleared, this is when I was 24 years old, and there's Mount Everest, you know, just sharp as a tack, 75 miles away, and having that moment of saying, gee, I wish I had somebody here that I loved with me to see yeah. this. But right, that memory, right. we all have things like that. But yes, you're yep. right to have experienced something like that with someone else, especially somebody that you trust, you admire, you care right. about, you respect, can be right. all the difference in the world. Well, I hope you release them to the public at some point, and I'll let Dr. J <laughs> go on with his questioning, and it's always a pleasure to hear you. Oh, so thank you. No, Lou, Lou yeah. if you have any more questions, by all means, ask Yeah, me. yeah. Hit me with I, another I think one. That's the main ones. That's those okay. are the main ones. All right. So. Well, thank yeah. you for joining me. Well, I'll call later. Yep. Sure. Very good, Lou. 
Danny, you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, you're very lucky to have somebody like Lou calling in. Lou, Lucian is, he is just on top of one. He, he, he knows his stuff. But I just wanted to ask you guys real quick, and then I'll get you back to the show. Um, if either of you saw the movie The Fourth Kind, that was out, um, I'm thinking about three or four years ago. Yes. I felt that movie did a huge disservice. Um, I, I agree, and I'll tell you why. Awesome. Because all the, the, the film that was supposed to be real uh, from police footage and, and all that, right. you go on IMDb and you'll see the actors and actresses from that was supposedly real footage. So you're right. I, I agree with you. What do you think about that, Peter? I, 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 as a film lover and wherever I can be a supporter of motion pictures, it sucked. It wasn't a very good movie. And it's unfortunate in that um, the director, his first film blew all of our minds, The Sixth Sense. Um, I don't care how jaded you were. Uh, that film was incredible. And it's a rough act to follow um, something so extraordinary as a creative person. I, I think his intentions were probably good. And um, as somebody who has a fascination, you know, not I'm not a crop circle researcher, but I was privileged to, for the first time two summers ago, to visit Wiltshire at the height of the crop circle season with um, several colleagues and have the, the great experience of being guided around a number of circles by some of the best specialists in the world who are there, you know, uh, straight through the season or year round. And that is their life. Um, it was a good idea that failed filmatically. And it's a shame. Um, one of my good friends is Colin Andrews. We've been close since 1991 or 92 when Colin gave his very first UF uh, a crop circle talk in the United States. And I followed his work um, uh, with great interest. And of course, he is to crop circle studies what Bud was to abduction studies, truly the father. In fact, it was Colin Andrews who coined the term crop circle. Um, and many people discount it now and just say, well, they're all fake or so many are fake. Why even bother studying the ones that are allegedly real? It's an incredibly important mystery. And to paraphrase my dear friend, colleague and mentor, Stanton Friedman, the question is not, has any UFO or crop circle been, you know, uh, an authentic manifestation of truly paranormal activity? Um, well, no, I, I just blew that one. Um, Stan's statement is, you know, are UFOs, the question is not, are UFOs manifestations of advanced technology under intelligent control coming and going with impunity? The question is, has anyone ever been? And of course, the answer to that overwhelmingly is yes. And one can certainly ascribe the same uh generalization to crop circles. But yeah, um, I'm digressing though. I, I did not enjoy the film and um, I think Joaquin Phoenix is a wonderful actor, but the script didn't work and it just wandered too far off field and it, it's a shame. It was a lost opportunity, I felt. Well, the thing about it was is that I actually uh, talked to, and I, I hate to pull out names, but uh, it's on a Coast to Coast interview I um, spoke to Whitley Strieber one night when he was hosting, and I asked him about the movie because I was so confused with what you were saying, Dr. J, about how they do the side-by-side -side camera. And he said, oh, no, that wasn't a real movie. That was a, that was a faux movie. It was meant to be that the whole time. And on top of that, Whitley and his wife were consultants on that movie. And that just, that just really bothered me. Um, mm. I just wanted to throw that out there and see what you guys thought about it. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, you've answered all of my questions, and it's truly been a wonderful show. Thank you, Dr. J. I'm looking forward to meeting you at Contact in the Desert. And congratulations, Danny. Congratulations. Thanks. And thank you for your call. We do have another call. And then after that, I have a message here to read a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Area code 419. Welcome to the show. What's your name? 
Hey, it's Frog. How you doing? Frog, uh, nice to hear yeah. from you. You have any uh, questions or comments uh, to Mr. Roberts? Well, yeah, it's a great show, by the way. Thank you. Um, I've I'm one that's I've been abducted. I've got an implant in the whole nine yards. Uh, I learned how to deal with abductions and all that sort of thing through meditation and through Reiki and talking to my Reiki master and all that because I was a very paranoid person for a while. Uh, but my question is has to do with disclosure. And mm -hmm. um, I think I talked with Dr. J about this the other night on the phone. Is How do we deal with... The, there can't be disclosure when, when everyone is so afraid. I mean, some people are violently afraid of it. I mean, if, 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 if a ship were to land out in front of the house, out on the street right now, every, all the neighbors would run out and want to shoot at it or mm. take their ball bats to it and, and, and kill it because they're scared of it. And mm. the government, knowing that's the way that it is, why would they want to um, disclose that sort of thing when we can't get along with our own neighbors? Mm -hmm. That's a, a huge and a very thoughtful question. And not without some irony, you've answered it for us. Um, I, I have tremendous admiration for my friend and colleague, Steve Bassett, um, Was was honored and privileged to be one of the individuals who gave testimony before the Congressional Committee at the um, citizen hearings in May of 2013 at the National Press Club in Washington, have watched the disclosure movement establish more centers of interest and activity, not just around this country, but in Europe, South America, Central America, and abroad in other locations. And it's a very important, a noble, and wonderful effort However, um, I don't think unless their hand is absolutely forced, perhaps by other intelligences, perhaps in some kind of grand blackmail by other counter forces within deep within the establishment. And I'm, you know, speaking out of the top of my head here, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I do know from what I know about human nature, what I understand about the entire post-war history of the so-called modern age of UFO sightings, that there are a hunk and lot of problems associated with just the question that you pose, um, partially. And again, it's amazing how they still trot out uh, certain elements of the public's reaction to the brilliant rendition of the great H.G. Um, Wells story in the Howard Fast radio play broadcast on CBS radio the night before Halloween 1938 by Orson Welles' Mercury Theater of the Air. And how many people freak the hell out around the United States, not even considering that this half-hour radio broadcast was collapsing weeks, if not longer, into you know, a matter of minutes, and there was commercial breaks. That's how subject to uh, the paranoia they were. Um, I think, in fact, if and when disclosure comes to us, it's going to come by a much more circuitous route. Let's just say hypothetically that, you know, the world leaders are all meeting about this, first, second, third world countries, emerging countries, uh, developing countries, however you want to put it, and that it's ultimately worked out that on a certain time, all the world leaders are going to go on their national media and say variations of, you know, at this moment, other world leaders are speaking to their citizens and my fellow Americans, Vietnamese, Chinese, Canadians, Brazilians, whatever. It's my solemn and serious duty to tell you we are not alone in the universe. We have known about this for many decades now. We've been trying to find a way to go public, but, you know, we've been concerned about the way that you folks would react. But there you go. We're not alone. UFOs are real. They come and go from a whole bunch of places. There are different civilizations that visit us. And, um, you know, we've got a brave new world here. And we're going to try to work it out. God bless America. Good night. Ain't gonna happen. 
one of the reasons is that it, it doesn't matter whether it's the far left, the far right, a Republican, a Democrat, a conservative, a progressive, a liberal, whatever. Every president is in the same damn trap. If it was President Obama that was going to do it, it'd be no di different than if President Bush had tried to do it. The first thing that would be obvious was that every single United States president, and let's throw in every British prime minister for that matter, since um, Churchill and Truman are unindicted co-conspirators in the greatest conspiracy and cover-up in the history of humanity. That's a problem to start with for these, you know, politicians. More, like you say, how can you just announce it with the understanding that, you know, we're all going to get through this. There may have been a time, and I think, and, and I, I give President Truman a lot of credit, I really genuinely feel, going back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the show, that if it had been up to him completely, he would have had his people study it for a couple of months, and by 1948, he would have done just that. And we would have been growing up in a very different world. But he would have just laid it out and, you know, let God sort it out and the human race as well. That didn't happen, of course. And I, I think that this schizophrenic, increasingly conspiracy-obsessed uh, society where uh, more and more people control um, less and less um, was set in motion in that period of time. Everything went out of kilter. The American dream became very perverted. This became a national security state and is, and this is the world that we live in. However, that doesn't mean disclosure is not going to happen. Um, it may come to us in the form of some kind of WikiLeaks release if Julian Assange isn't murdered um, or in some other whistleblower at the National Security Agency who is able to put forward enough credible, formally highly classified information. One of my favorite things, which is hardly even thought of now, is going back to the late 70s, good old NASA. I don't know how long this lasted. Maybe it was a window of a year or two. This is all, of course, pre-digital. They, You could get a catalog from NASA, and it had a couple of thousand little numbers in it. Each number related to, I think it was a couple of thousand, maybe it was just hundreds. It was a long time ago. But it was a paper catalog you could order. And each one of those little numbers related to a Hasselblad high-quality 8 by 10 photographic print. Not a Xerox of a print, but an original chemical photographic print made with the highest resolution ca uh, cameras available at the time as they circled the moon from several hundred miles up. There were, in fact, several hundred thousand of these pictures. How could there not be? And NASA had this idea that they'd make a selection of them available to the public. Unfortunately for NASA, fortunately for inquisitive minds like myself, they did not have anything approaching the manpower to go over all of these prints very carefully, micrometer by micrometer with a 10 power loop to see if there was anything really weird in any of these photos. And so they just went out. And at one point, myself, my now oldest living colleague in the work, Antonio Huneas, and a few of us kicked in a couple of bucks each. The photos were a dollar each. And we got like a dozen or 15 photos and split them up and started to go over them carefully. And then, you know, we looked at each, everybody had a chance to look at all of them. And we found some really weird stuff. Now, we all know that, you know, you can see the shape of a lamb in a cloud at just the right moment. The old man in the mountain in New Hampshire before it collapsed and fell off the mountain. The face of Jesus in a tortilla chip. Nature has a way of mimicking representational reality to a degree. This was not that. There were some remarkable things. Now, those pictures are out there. Um, it's, it's frustrating now because mostly when you find them, they're in a really um, interesting book, like, say, David Childress's Extraterrestrial Archaeology, 
but they've got to be at least third generation Xerox prints and they're starting to really break up or uh, there's very little gray in them. They're, they're just black and white and um, much more harsh to read. But you can still see with the understanding that in fact they are authentic, which now anybody can question, that there's some weird stuff on the surface of the moon. Does this represent ancient civilizations, current operations? Could it be us? Is a lot of it, you know, super ancient, whatever. Um, I would love to see those photos, those photos become the center of a huge breaking story and being posted all the hell over the place. Of course, the first thing that would happen would be the disinformers um, would make a great case for them not being authentic.